for about 20 years. It was just a, and I was an adjunct faculty member, not a full-time faculty member, so once a year I would get the opportunity of teaching first-year students. And uh, the subject that I chose was leadership because we didn't really have a major in leadership or an area of leadership. And so I got to read about leadership you know, for a long period of time and listen to others speak about leadership. And many years ago, about 20 years ago, a professor from Duke University was at Pepperdine and was talking about leadership, and she made this statement. She said, you know, you really ought to look at the Old Testament leaders and see what they have to say, both good and bad, about leadership. And that started me thinking. And so I thought, you know, maybe her name was Elizabeth Ochtemeyer. She's passed on now, but she was a great, great biblical scholar. And so I thought it might be beneficial this morning to look at some good and bad examples about leadership so we can see maybe how we should be better leaders. And thank you for pulling that up this day. Has anyone ever struggled with the behavior of a family member, you know, who is maybe not living as consistently as maybe they should have been um, living and then wondering, okay, what do you do about that? Do you confront that family member? Do you talk to them about that or do you just pray about that? And I'll give some examples from my own life. When I was a senior in high school in 1965, I have a, I have a younger brother who's three years younger, so he was a freshman. And uh, one time I got a ride with a friend home from school, a guy on the track team, and uh, I couldn't find my brother to say, hey, hop in the car with us. And so we were driving home, and wouldn't you know, we passed him you know, as we were driving home, and he was smoking. And I, and even back then, you know, before all the uh, statistics came out about the death rate you know, for those who smoke, I knew it was bad for him, physically and spiritually. So I'm going, okay, do I say something to him? Or do I not say something to him? And the, the parable of the, the log coming out of the eye and the splinter in the other person's eye kind of made me say, no, I'm not going to talk to him. So I didn't. I, I hesitated. I, I wimped out. And fortunately, after he got married and started having kids, he stopped smoking. And that, and that was a blessing. So he hasn't smoked for, you know, 40 years now. And then Sandy and I have a sister-in-law um, who, after she left home, started drinking because she entered her professional career. And it got to the point where she was basically a functioning alcoholic. And again, I never said anything to her. One time she called me late at night and she was drunk and she started uh, being very abusive about a member of our family. And um, I hung up on her. And then she called back. She said, did you hang up on me? And I said, yeah, I, I did. I said, I, I, I just couldn't handle what you were saying. But that was all I did. I wimped out again. I never said anything else to her about changing her behavior. Fortunately, after she married, her husband got her into AA, and now she's been clean and sober for over 10 years, and that's a blessing. But what did I do? I, I didn't do anything. I didn't say anything to her. So what would you do as God's person if someone in your family had a challenge and you hesitated and you didn't say anything to them? I'll give some examples from Scripture. Think about Isaac, not our Isaac, okay? <laughs> but Isaac, who has Jacob and Esau, basically got a son who is a deceiver and a liar. You remember the story, don't you? You know, um, Jacob uh, has Esau come in, and Esau's hungry, and he says, sure, I'll give you some of these red lentils, but you've got to give me your birthright. And then later on, when Rebecca comes to him and says, you know what, I think, I think you ought to get the number one blessing, so why don't you put some goat hair on your arms and, and go talk to Isaac. And so he basically comes in and lies to his father. His father says, isn't this Esau? You sound kind of like Jacob. Oh, yeah, it's Esau. And so he gets the number one blessing. So you're Isaac, and you see Jacob the next day going from tent to tent. Do you say anything to him? Jacob, how come you came to me and lied to me about you being Esau? There's no record that that conversation ever happened. Rebecca sees the writing on the wall and she comes to Jacob and says, I think it's time for you to get out of here. <laughs> you need to go back to my family and get a wife there. Don't get a wife from, from these Canaanites. And so Jacob gives him a second blessing. But there's no confrontation in Scripture about that Isaac and Jacob conversation. Next, what about Manoah? You're all, you're all saying, okay, who's Manoah? Manoah 
was Samson's father. And I've gotten a click. Okay, there we go. Manoah was Samson's father. And basically, Samson asks his father to... That word didn't come across, did it? Pimp for him. It was an amazing story. Here, Manoah and his wife have raised Samson in a Nazarite vow. Do you know what a Nazarite vow is? He couldn't eat even the skins of grapes. He couldn't eat grape juice. He couldn't eat raisins. He couldn't eat grape seed oil. For his entire life, he had to not shave his head, and he could not eat anything from the fruit of the vine. So they were super, super religious in him. From the time before he was born, while he was pregnant in his mother's womb, until he became a judge, he could not do those things. So he had this very, very strict diet and regulations. But then when it comes to his sexual life, he goes to his dad and he says, esteemed woman for me. I like her. Go get her for me. And what does Manoah do? I'm sorry this thing keeps cutting in and out. Maybe I'll just stand here. What does Manoah do? He says, you know, aren't there any good Jewish women for you? And Samson's will is stronger than Manoah's will. And he says, no, I like her. Go get her for me. Third example is Andrew. You're Andrew, and you've got this brother Peter, and Peter's this big rock guy. And um, Peter denies Jesus three times. And it's the next day the crucifixion has happened. Can you imagine what Andrew might say to Peter? We have no record of it. Did he confront him? Did he give him a hug? Did he challenge him? We, we just don't know. There's no record of it in Scripture. But we do have a record of this fourth one, Aaron and Moses. There's an entire chapter about their conversation, and that's what I want to look at this morning. If you have your Bibles, you might read along with me. I've also put them on the PowerPoint. It's from Exodus chapter 32. So you're Moses, and you're up on Mount Sinai, and then you hear there's rumbling down in the camp, and God says you need to get back down there. And you've been fasting for 40 days, and it's a really critical time in the history of the people of Israel. And your own brother Aaron, the guy that stood beside you when you went to faith times for those 10 plagues, he stood behind, beside you and was your spokesperson. And instead of using his gifts to give glory to God, what does he do? He makes a golden calf. He wimps out. So Aaron is a coward. Let's read this verse together. This is from Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And am I clicking the right side? There we go. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives and your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So, Aaron is cowardly. Can you imagine the scene? I'm asking you to imagine a lot today. Can you imagine the scene when these people come to Aaron? Do you think it was a nice, quiet, dignified delegation? You know, one guy from each tribe, and they come up to Aaron, and they say, oh, please, Aaron, you know, we're so concerned. Where is this Moses gone? Did he, did he run away with Jethro back to Midian? You know, please help us with that. No, it's, it's a raucous, raucous thing. Where is this Moses? He's abandoned us. 40 days, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. It's a very challenging scene. And Moses, I mean, Aaron, gives in to that, doesn't he? He says, okay, give me your gold. Take off your earrings, and I'll make something for you. Notice one thing. They say, not your brother Moses. What do they say? This fellow Moses, it's a contemptuous term. It's a derogatory term. It's a diminishing term. This Fellow Moses, not your brother Moses, has run off and left us. We don't know where he is. Can you think of another passage in Scripture where the, that diminishing term, this, is used? Hmm? Adam? Yeah, Adam. I was thinking of a parable where there are two brothers. 
The parable of the prodigal son or the waiting father? When the prodigal son comes back, the elder brother says, this son of yours who has taken all this money and gone off to waste it on prostitutes and all kinds of riotous living, it's that same word, this. That's what this peop the people are saying to Aaron. This fellow Moses, not our leader Moses, not our servant Moses, but this fellow Moses. Have you ever behaved cowardly? I, I know I have. Too often I've had opportunities to share my faith with others and I, and I haven't done it out of fear or embarrassment or whatever. But Moses, on the other hand, is fearless. And if you could click it again for me. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses. They are stiff-necked. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and then I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Click. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that you brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster that he had threatened. Would you have the courage to do that? Would you have the courage to speak back to God? This is one of the few times in Scripture that a human changed God's mind. God was ready to start all over. And Moses says, you know, let's reconsider. You don't want all these other nations to think of you in this way. And he uses several arguments on it. Remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And he talks God down from his anger. I don't, I don't know that I would have the courage to do that. Second, Aaron minimized his sin and blamed others. When Moses confronts him in verse 21, Moses says, What did these people do to you that you led them to such great sin? Do not be angry, my lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, Make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off, and they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Isn't that one of the funniest lines in Scripture? Well, they, I got all this gold, and I just kind of tossed it into the fire, and lo and behold, it was in the shape of a calf. Does that sound like two boys in the backyard playing, and they get into trouble, and, they, and mom confronts them? Well... Mom, we were playing with these stones. You wanted us to work in the garden. We were playing with these stones, and we were tossing them back and forth, and one came kind of high, and, ooh, I bumped it, and it went through the window. It wasn't my fault. It was Johnny's fault. Can you think of your own kids, those of you who have children, and excuses that they might give like that? It rem reminds me of Adam. You mentioned Adam earlier. It reminds me of Adam when God came to him and said, hey, what's going on here? It was the woman that gave me that fruit and you know what you gave me that woman what's the implication it's your fault God don't our kids do that don't we do that we blame other people for our own sin that's what Aaron is doing here he minimized his own sin and he blamed others but what does Moses do Moses goes back to the Lord and says oh what a great sin these people have made, done, have committed. They made themselves gods of gold. But now, please forgive their sin. But if not, blot me out of the book you have written. Isn't that amazing? I mean, he's like Elijah years later, who felt he was the only one who continued to serve God. He says, okay, okay, they blew it. Put it all on me. Blot me out of your book. Yeah, I've been following you for over 80 years. Blot me out. If there's a sin here and the time to take place for this sin, blot me out. I don't know that I would have the strength of the faith to do that. Then third, verse 25. 
says that Moses let the Aaron, let the Israelites get out of control, and thereby they were becoming a laughing stock to their enemies. Those of you who are teachers or coaches or in the military, what happens when you let the people who are responsible to you get out of control? What if you've got a game the next day and you have no discipline in your football team? Are you going to win that game? Absolutely not. What if you're trying to get across some really important principle in your class and your class is really disruptive? Are they going to be effective? Are they going to learn? No. And if you're a general and you're in battle, what's going to happen if you have no discipline in that team that reports to you? That's what Moses is saying here. He says, you let them get out of control. But Moses takes control. It's kind of a hard verse here. What does he do? He says, who's on the Lord's side? And all the Levites come to him. Who are the Levites? Aaron's tribe. So the Levites come to support Moses. And he says, okay, strap on, strap on your swords and go through, the, go through all the children of Israel and just kill a bunch of people. And so a bunch of people died that day. Brother, neighbor, friend. Isn't that what a surgeon does? Those of you who have a cancer, a surgeon has to take out that part of the body that is causing pain. And yet it's pain to our bodies. But the end result is good. Um, those of you who are supervisors, what happens if you have a disruptive person in your, in your crew? Do you dismiss them or do you try to change them? Well, hopefully you try to redeem them first. But sometimes you have to dismiss people. And I apologize for this. I must have tightened it up too much. Tell you what, I'm going to take this off here. I've been very fortunate that I've had really good people work for me over the years, but twice I had to terminate someone. And Sandy knows that I agonized over that. I would have sleepless nights trying to say, can we do something to make this person a more valuable contribution to our team? But they were a distraction. They were causing us to be unproductive. And I went and talked to HR, you know, human resources, and I said, what do I do about this person? And they said, you're going to have to terminate her. And it was really, really hard. Well, that's what Moses is doing here. He says, there's sometimes you have to go in and remove the distraction. Fourth, Aaron is indecisive. He's like a deer in the headlights. He doesn't know what to do when all this challenge is coming. And so, does he send out a delegation to look for Moses? Does he say, be patient to the crowd? No, he gives in to them. So that that's, they end up sinning. He's indecisive. But Moses is decisive. What does he do first? He breaks those tablets. He'd been up on the mountain for 40, 40 days. He has these wonderful, wonderful tablets. And if you remember the movie with Charlton Heston, he comes down from the mountain and he throws them at the bottom of the mountain, breaks the tablets, and then he says, grind up that golden calf and put it in some water and everybody drink from it. it. Can you imagine? Maybe it, it might have been wood with gold on the outside. I don't know for sure. But all the Israelites had to drink from that. What's he basically doing? He's saying, your God is not an effective God. And because he's not an effective God, we need to follow the Lord. You cannot depend upon a golden calf. Finally, Aaron appears self-serving. But Moses is humble. I'm going to read verses 30 and 32 to you again. The next day, Moses said to the people, you've committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Key word here, atonement. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold, but now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. How humble and self-sacrificing is that for Moses to say that? Would you be strong enough to sacrifice yourself for someone else? You know, Jesus says one of the greatest things that can happen is to die for a righteous person, but to die for someone who did not deserve it? My dad did that. He didn't die, but he sacrificed himself for someone else. My siblings and I learned this story 40 years after it happened. He was in World War II, and um, his ship was sunk. He was on a destroyer. He was ship was sunk by a kamikaze. Those of you who are younger may not know what a kamikaze is, but toward the end of the war, 
the Japanese uh, military loaded up all these planes with extra big bombs and put these young pilots in it. And they said, we can't shoot everybody down, just crash into a ship. And that happened to my dad. He was on a destroyer. And the ship was sunk. And he grabbed his life vest and jumped into the water, as everyone else did. And then he started gathering guys up. And then he noticed that his own lieutenant, the guy that he reported to, didn't get in the water with his life vest. So what does my dad do? He gives up his life vest for this lieutenant. How many hours was it that he had to trade, tread water? 12 hours my dad treaded water in the ocean in the South Pacific until they were picked up. I learned this story from my mom because she said, I got this letter from your dad and um, he said, sorry I can't use my regular stationery. My other stationery got wet. Yeah, you know, there was censorship back then. He couldn't say the SS Little went down to a kamikaze. He said, my other stationery got wet. And then after he was out of the war in 1945, he says that the reason it got wet was our ship went down. Would you be willing to sacrifice your life for the good of others? That's what Moses is doing here. If your entire family or work group made a big mistake of some kind, are you willing to take the blame for them? even if you're not responsible. My friend Don Robertson, who's here today, and I were in business together 35 years ago. We were in a marketing company. And the leader of our company said this, and if you could click it, good and effective leaders pass blame up and pass credit down. That's what Moses is doing here. He passed blame up to himself. If you're a leader of a football team, or a high school class, or a Sunday school class, pass blame up and pass credit down, and then you'll be a good leader. So I've talked about two types of leaders today. One is a self-sacrificing servant leader, and one is a self-serving leader. Which are you? At times, do you act cowardly, blaming others, minimizing your faults, letting your charges get out of control, basically waffling in your beliefs? Are you a decisive leader, taking responsibility for others' mistakes, fearlessly approaching wrong, and doing it in a humble way? I think there's a lot that we can learn from Moses. If we were to summarize his leadership in one word, what do you think it might be? I would call it servant leadership, and that's what I taught my kids, my freshman students at Pepperdine. We studied all the different theories of leadership and we concluded in the last couple of weeks on servant leadership. Because he did not think of himself, he thought of others. He put his ego away and humbly served them. Can you think of another person who was a servant leader? Moses is basically foreshadowing that kind of leadership. Who was the greatest servant leader who ever lived? It was Jesus. Because he did not deserve the fate that he received, but he sacrificed himself so that you and I could have life eternal. So today, are you ready to confess your sin? That you have not been the kind of leader you need to be in your family or in your church or in your school or in your job? Are you willing to wash away your sin? That's the greatest thing about being a Christian is we get the Holy Spirit. First we get forgiven of our sins, and then we get the Holy Spirit Daily and hourly and minute by minute so that we cannot be sinful anymore. Or what if you're already a servant of Christ, but you haven't been very faithful? Well, we have a blessing of having some great shepherds here, and they are standing at the back so that when we finish here, when we sing this next song, if you want to talk to them about how you can be a better, more faithful follower of Christ, then you can go to the back and talk to them. We already sung a song called Make Me a Servant. We're now going to sing a song, I am thine, O Lord. That's our prayer, isn't it? We want to be his. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. Whatever your need, let's stand together as we sing.